Saturday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. Uh, and my sister, I went to visit my sister last week and she's all over me about when am I gonna get my fourth dose. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, but in the meantime, let's look at what's going on in the world from a virology perspective. Uh, still very hot in Chile. I uh, know it's hot, but I mean, a lot of virus replication going on there. Uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Australia, Hong Kong is still really hot. Uh, and so, and mostly Europe. So the, the concerns I have about Europe always is, we often ha uh, have reflect what's going on in Europe a few weeks later. And if you see worldwide, this is a, a, the, sort of the problem we're facing. Things were really getting better, and then that second Omicron variant kicked up, and it's beginning to go up, but it looks like it might be plateauing. So hopefully we'll continue to fall through the summer. But because Europe's had an uptick, I'm a little concerned that we may, we may well see an uptick, uptick in uh, parts of the summer. So. Right now, what's going on in Europe, Germany with 83 million people saw 250,000 new cases and 250 deaths per day last week. So kind of a surge there. The Netherlands, it was a small country with 18 million, averaging 60,000 cases. The United King Kingdom is averaging 65,000 cases a day and 80 deaths per day. And as a result, they're pushing a second booster already, even though CDC isn't here. Uh, they want to give a fourth dose to about 5 million people who they view as increased vulnerability, 75 and older, those over 12 who are immunosuppressed, and nursing home residents. And what they want to do is give a second booster six months later. So that's, that's not approved here, but that's what they're doing. Now in our, you know, in our country, the BA.2, the second Omicron variant, it accounts for 35% of the viruses nationally. And in some parts of the country, particularly the Northeast, it's almost 60%. Uh, and if you think about it, uh, you know, we're still only at 65% vaccinated compared to Germany and UK, which are in the 75, 76%. So while we're, you know, experiencing a downslope, I'm a little concerned we might have a little uptick in the spring. Uh, so if, if you look at, you know, Germany, Greece, France, the United Kingdom, they're all going up. You can see the United States is still down. But we often reflect what goes on in Europe a few weeks later, so we might see a little bit of an uptick. On the positive side right now, and God knows, let's look for some positive things. You know, it's really remarkable how, if you look back to January 28th and compare it to this week, I mean, we look great. There are some hot spots, though. Uh, Kentucky, uh, Arkansas, if you look at the panhandle of Texas and Idaho, all have uh, a lot of virus uh, replication going on. And those are areas where we don't have a lot of wastewater surveillance. But if you look at the CDC wastewater surveillance, there are some hot spots. Uh, I've circled them in red, but you can see them in, in uh, Ohio, in Illinois, Wisconsin, parts of Missouri, parts of Florida, even North Carolina, Westchester County in New York and Maine, some in Seattle area and, the D and around San Francisco. So the wastewater hotspots are likely to be places where you see an emergence of cases. And so my guess is, even though we're coming down, like Europe, we'll begin to see uh, an uptick. And if you look at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation on the University of Washington, they're predicting the same thing. If you look at it, we're here today coming down, but they're predicting within about you know, April, May, we'll begin to see an uptick in cases. Now, I don't think we're going to see a big surge, hopefully. <laughs> I'm praying we don't. But, you know, the country has been either infected or vaccinated enough that I think there's enough immunity that we, were, we will likely see an uptick, but hopefully nothing bad for the rest of the summer. As our immunity wanes, all bets are off for the fall, so we'll have to see. But I have some news on that as well. So in, in Texas, right now, the panhandle is a hot spot. Our friends at Dimmick County, <laughs> they're, they're down to less than 10 cases per 100,000, so they're doing great. The Havilinas have moved out for the summer. Uh, but Lipscomb County right now is the hottest spot in Texas, but most of the panhandle is really pretty hot, uh, which is kind of difficult to understand. I don't know what the vaccination rates are there, but I have to check. If you look at our local uh, Texas Medical Center, we're down to 315 cases per, per day. You know, as I said, our target is 200, but we're really getting there. It looks like the number of cases in hospital have, have plateaued. So we had dropped to 77. We're about 103 per day last week. 
And again, I think because there's so much uh, virus out there that people will be admitted with the virus, but not necessarily because of the virus. So we're going to see hospitalizations as people get admitted for uh, normal procedures. There are going to be some positive people. As I mentioned, uh, the BA.2 is growing. It's now up to 35%. It was almost nothing. It's now up to 35%. But because the pool is shrinking, I don't see that we'll have a, a giant spike. The pool of susceptible individuals is getting smaller, even though BA.2 is outcompeting BA.1. I'm hopeful that, that because the pool is small enough that we won't see a giant spike of cases. Uh, similar uh, story in the world. Uh, at a global level, BA.1 uh, is being outcompeted by BA.2, but it's still the predominant species. Um, and, you know, the BA.2 is different with three, three or four amino acids in the spike protein, which confers a slightly higher infectivity rate, about 30% more transmissible than BA.1. Uh, and we reviewed some data last week where it is possible, they look, there was a study that looked at 1.8 million people, uh, and there were 47 individuals who had, uh, who had gotten BA.1 and then reinfected with BA.2 fairly soon after that. But most of the time, most of the big studies show that if you're infected with BA.2 or BA.1, it confers uh, resistance to the other strain. So I'm hopeful that, you know, that's true uh, in the majority of cases. Uh, and so if you've been infected with Omicron earlier on, you probably will be resistant to the BA.2 that's circulating now. Uh, there was a really interesting study that I want to review with you. Uh, that's in, it's in Nature uh, in review. It was by a combination of a bunch of laboratories in J Japan and the United States looking at uh, how infective uh, BA.2 and BA.1 are relative to the other uh, variants. And so while BA.1 has become the dominant in most countries, BA.2 is, as I mentioned, emerging. It's the dominant species in, Philipp in the Philippines, India, and Denmark. In the United States, as I mentioned, it's 35%. So there was a study that these investigators did that put in the human ACE2 receptor by in transgenic mice and hamsters. So these rodents would now be uh, able to be infected with this to see infectivity and pathogenesis. And what they showed was that the BA.1 and BA.2 are significantly less pathogenic than the previous variants, like the Delta variant. Uh, and also what's very encouraging in these animal models that many of the, the antivirals actually still are very effective. Uh, one of the really interesting things to, to show is there is this, in this study, they looked at these uh, in, in transgenic hamsters and infected them with uh, either BA.2 or the original variant. And what you can see is the ones that had the, the original virus that was isolated in, uh, from China, they, had, they lost weight and most of them died, whereas if you look at the, the, uh, the BA.2 and BA.1, they didn't lose weight and there was very little mortality. And when you looked at where the virus was growing, it grows very well in the lungs in uh, the original strain and it doesn't grow very well if it's BA.1 or 2, but in the nasal turbinates it's the same. And this is what we're seeing clinically, that there's less pneumonia with the Omicron variants uh, it, but it, it grows very well in the upper airways, and it's less pathogenic, so you get less uh, uh, pneumonia and less death. So that's good. I mean, that, it's never good to have a virus floating around, but it's good to have one that's less uh, virulent and less, uh, less virulent. And it causes less morbidity and mortality in people. So why not just, you know, go ahead and give another uh, a fourth dose, and you know, another uh, booster? And the reason is there's still some concern about the myocarditis that develops uh, in, in people who get vaccinated. So there was a big study uh, published in JAMA out of Israel that looked at military recruits. And they looked at 126,000 military re recruits all the way up to September 30th, 2021. And then they followed them for another month uh, to see whether or not they developed uh, a myocarditis. And 79% and of the men and 90% of the women were between the ages of 18 24. And they only found nine cases of myocarditis. All of them were in young men. Uh, one case was likely due to COVID, so they excluded that. And of the eight remaining cases, uh, four developed symptoms within a week of vaccination, three developed symptoms within eight to 10 days after uh, vaccination. One does it develop symptoms over two weeks, so they sort of excluded it. So they really thought that they had seven good cases. All were mild, 
None had serious problems and all recovered. And what they did was calculate the incidence of that complication of the vaccine. It was three to five per 100,000. So that's a very low complication rate in young uh, recruits. There was a similar study actually um, by Laura Shekinanami and uh, of Baylor College of Medicine in Texas Children's. She was part of a group that looked at 139 diagnostic cases of uh, myocarditis, and they didn't do an incidence calculation, but they followed them and they basically found the same thing. They were all mild, everyone recovered. So that's not a reason to avoid uh, vaccination. Uh, the other thing is that the reason uh, Israel is really pushing for a second, uh, a second booster is they've had a significant spike in their uh, infection rate and hospitalizations. Uh, and they've seen that there's been a lot of immune escape. In other words, people who were either vaccinated or people who had been infected with the previous variants were getting infected with Omicron. And so what they've decided to do is do a fourth dose of four months after the third dose in people who are at risk. That's what my sister wants. But, you know, we haven't approved that, and there's no real evidence right now that it's needed. But in that study that they did, they showed that there was a significant benefit. That's, again, this is just from the Israel study, that a fourth vaccine, they were twice as protected against infection than those, those vaccinated with three doses, and they had a three to five times better protection against severe illness compared to those vaccinated with three doses. The only problem with that study is that um, we haven't seen that rate of a problem after three doses. So. So other vaccines, uh, vaccines in the news, lots of really good information. Um, Moderna has now asked the FDA uh, to allow adults 18 and older to receive a second booster shot amid concerns uh, the, about this immune protection. So they're, they're quoting the Israeli studies and saying, look, we, let's just give it to everybody over the age of 18, a fourth shot, because we know we're going to come back and ask for it. Uh, Pfizer didn't do that. They tried to limit it just to 65 and older. Uh, but as I said, Moderna is much broader, uh, asking for much broader approval. They're also planning to request approval for children under the age of six. They now have a study that shows that the, their two-shot regimen of 25 micrograms each, which is one quarter of the adult dose, provides good protection and with very little complications. They looked at 6,700 uh, children under the age of six, uh, and they reported very, very mild uh, side effects. And so they're hoping to get kids under six uh, with their vaccine. Again, we don't have the data on efficacy, so it's really hard to know. The European agency is uh, now reporting that there will be Omicron-specific vaccines available probably by uh, the end of the summer. And so from my perspective, frankly, I'd like to see us, if we're going to do a fourth shot, I'd like it to be more specific for Omicron rather than the same vaccine that we had uh, for Wuhan. One last really interesting finding, we've talked a lot about the animal reservoirs. You know, we, we talked, I think, two weeks ago about probably entered, uh, the virus entered from bats to, a, 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 to pangolin and another intermediate species before it jumped to man. And we showed uh, in the Wuhan wet markets the, the deer that were being sold. Well, turns out white-tailed deer are very efficient at, at uh, carrying this virus. There is a, a recent study from southwestern Ontario that actually did a, a, an analysis of all the viral mutants, coronavirus mutants that came out of these white deer population. And you can see the diversity. So a huge amount of diversity. So this is, this viruses, these viruses are replicating in the white-tailed deer just as it's replicating in humans, and it's diverging separately. So many, many different mutations. The Canadian Wildlife Association reported 76 different mutations uh, among 37 different uh, animals that were non-human. Non and so this is really beginning to show that we have this sort of parallel coronavirus infection in white-tailed deer. And they identified one Ontario man who seems to be, in, who got infected with the white-tailed deer sequence. So again, it, it shows the importance of surveillance, of following these reservoirs, because that is where the next coronavirus uh, epidemic is going to happen or pandemic is going to happen. And we need to be surveilling all these animal populations that can carry the virus. So I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, really exciting news on the All of Us study. The NIH sponsored the All of Us study, which is to really sequence 1 million people, uh, and, and they released the first 100,000 data sets. So that's really exciting, you know, that's now available for all, kind, all scientists to begin to analyze. 
Our uh, Human Genome Sequencing Center is one of the three or four centers that's involved with this project, so very exciting. Also wanted to uh, give a giant shout out to Dr. Marty Matzik, who is the recipient of the 2022 Carl G. Hartman Award from the Society for the Study of Reproduction. Uh, it's in recognition of his, his research and scholarly achievements. Uh, he's the chair of the Department of Pathology and Immunology and director for the Center for uh, Drug Discovery and a member of the National Academy of Science. I also want a giant shout out to Representative Ann Johnson, who came by. She's a member of the Texas House of Representatives. She visited Baylor and presented to me a resolution thanking Baylor for all of our response uh, during the COVID pandemic. So thank you, Representative Johnson, for coming and visiting us. And then, uh, of course, you probably know that this past week was, was Puppy Day. Uh, and there's a bunch of pictures of uh, Lily being posted on, on Instagram, and as well, I wanted to give a big shout out to Leo, uh, Lily's brother, uh, who had his birthday this past week. And the biggest shout of all, it was Match Day. All the fourth year medical students who uh, participated in Match Day, this is where they find out after they graduate from medical school where they're going to be doing their, uh, their graduate medical education. We had 163 Baylor students, 44% of them went into primary care. 39% will be continuing to train at Baylor and 61 will stay in the state of Texas. So big week, very exciting news, fantastic match day. Uh, and I hope everyone stays safe and healthy and I can't wait to see you next week.